people say that paranormal events aren't happening in Siskiyou County, that it's nothing but a bunch of stupid hippies up in Shasta that have done too many mind-altering substances. So we went up there with a group to seek the truth for ourselves. Our group consisted of me, my wife Judy, and our friends Eldon and Lorraine. Eldon was into UAPs and aliens, and was interested in the various UFO cults that exist up in Shasta. He was doing research for his next book. Lorraine was a spiritualist, medium type, that was into channeling. Judy and me, well, we were amateur Bigfoot hunters and cryptid enthusiasts. So we figured that between the four of us, we were more than likely to have a relaxing weekend and maybe one of us would come up with something that we could add to our blogs or newsletters and maybe Eldon would get some good research for his book. But what happened to us, what we encountered up there in Siskiyou County was so far beyond anything we were prepared for that I doubt I'll ever be the same again. A horrific nightmare that resulted in the loss of two lives and Judy's permanent insanity. I made it home, mind intact, but I bear other scars from that dark trip into the deep woods of Mount Shasta. We didn't want to camp out and to live out of tents, something we would have preferred when we were younger, but weren't even considering now that we were in our 40s. So we got an Airbnb off McLeod Avenue in a tiny town called Weed, and yes, that is really what it is called. It was a little shack of a place, but it was nice. Very serene and inviting, cozy little house, definitely far better than a tent. When we first got to the place and checked in, it was a bit stuffy and stale, like the last occupants had smoked too much in there and it never really cleared out. Things seemed normal initially, but soon we found the first sign that something was really wrong. There was a pamphlet in the top drawer of the dresser in the master bedroom from a local religious organization, and I use the term as lightly as possible, that operated in the area. Something about the Church of Light and Life or some such nonsense. According to their card, the church wanted to raise everyone's vibration and ascend into higher dimensions and believed that it was only possible if all of humanity tuned in together and practiced their message. Well, sounded more like hippie mumbo jumbo to me, but we decided to call the number after all, we were up there in Shasta to have supernatural paranormal experiences, right? If only we had known. After a brief talk with the church, Judy said we were invited to their meeting and that they gave her directions. We were all invited, and there was going to be a meal and a ceremony to celebrate the summer solstice or something. We were all in agreement that it wouldn't be the most exciting thing, but maybe some of the locals, especially if they were into New Age religious stuff, could point us in the direction of Bigfoot or maybe a UAP hotspot on the mountain. So we loaded up in the SUV and headed a few miles down the road to the place where the lady from the church said we should turn. And we barely saw the little road we needed to turn onto. It was so remote, untended, and overgrown that we missed it at first. I remember saying that I thought it was just a logging access road and there were no official markers and I thought we were in the wrong place, but nobody listened. I really wish they had. As we drove down the glorified dirt path, the going was slow. We trudged on at a snail's pace and barely made any progress, but eventually the road seemed to smooth out a bit and we started making better time. As I was about to ask how far down the forsaken lane we needed to go, something ran across the road right in front of us. It was just getting to be dusk and the sun was starting to set, but we saw the thing clearly. It was easily eight feet tall, probably more like nine. It was lanky, gangly, and looked emaciated. The thing was covered in long, wispy fur and it was a light gray color. We didn't get a good look at its face, but it didn't seem to even notice or care that we were there. It just walked on across the road and into the tree line. Eldon slammed the brakes and we jumped out of the car, all four of us in hot pursuit of whatever the thing was, trying to get a picture of it. Lorraine was messing around with a telephoto lens, trying to get the thing attached to her camera, and Judy running through the woods, trying to capture the thing on her cell phone, figuring some video was better than no video, even if it was low quality. But there was no sign of the creature, whatever it was. It walked slowly and casually across the road, but as soon as it hit the trees, it simply disappeared. Like a ghost. Like it was never there. After running after it, even though we had no idea where it went, we were soon spread out over a pretty wide area. I could see Judy, but had lost sight of Eldon and Lorraine. 
I yelled out, Hey guys, I think we missed it. Let's go back. But there was no answer. So I motioned for Judy to join me as she was a good 50 yards ahead of me and I turned toward the direction I thought Eldon and Lorraine had gone. I kept yelling for them but wasn't even getting a reply. I turned to make sure that Judy was still behind me and I was shocked to see that she was standing where she had been, completely still with her arms at her sides. And the grey creature, whatever the fuck it was, was standing right in front of her, maybe a foot from her, just glowering down at her. It had each of its clawed hands over one of her ears and appeared to be leaning in, whispering something to her. Get away from her, you... I didn't know what to call it, and I'm sure a flurry of profanity spilled from my lips. I ran towards Judy, realizing I didn't even know what the animal was, let alone how to fight it. It was then that it looked up at me, as if breaking away from hypnotizing Judy. It stood up taller and looked me right in the eye. What I saw was not human, but neither did it seem to be animal. It was something maybe between or completely other. Its face was hard and feral looking, covered in fur. I had to wonder what I was looking at, but the weirdest part is that the eyes seemed to glow with a blue light. It it was intense. I tried to keep going, but for some reason I stopped mid-stride in my run and was completely unable to move. The thing had somehow paralyzed me. I could only move my eyelids. I watched in horror as the thing turned its attention back to Judy. The blue glow in its eyes seemed to grow more intense and the light became overwhelming, completely obscuring both Judy and the creature. It felt like forever before the light subsided, but I could tell it was only a few seconds. I collapsed and noticed I had control of my body again as I got back to my feet. Judy was just standing there. I ran over to her and found her in a comatose state, completely out of it, a state from which she has never really recovered, even after all these years. I couldn't get her attention with words, and I couldn't get her to make eye contact, but I grabbed her hand and led her through the woods, towards where I thought we had come from, and hopefully back to the car. Judy was slow, and it probably would have been faster to have just carried her, but she did continue to follow along after me as long as I was holding her hand. She seemed to understand where we were going and what we were doing. I was absolutely panicked and distraught beyond belief. I had never been in such a state and I know that if Judy had been capable of being the one to help me, then I would have just suffered a nervous breakdown. But I know I had to keep on going for both our sakes. So that is all I focused on getting Judy back to the car and hopefully finding Eldon and Lorraine along the way. We were obviously lost as the sun had set. Judy had lost her phone and her camera, but I had my phone and we tried to navigate by the flashlight. It was even more slow going, but eventually we made it to the road and I was glad for a minute. But then we got to the car and I could tell from pretty far down the road that something wasn't right. As we got to it, I saw a huge puddle of blood and some bloody fingerprints on the windshield. It looked to be Eldon's print as he was six foot five and had enormous hands. I didn't have the key and didn't know how to hotwire a car so we just started walking. We walked down that dark service road for miles, eventually getting back out to the state road we were on. I knew it was about five miles walk back to the Airbnb but I didn't care. I was just happy. We were out of those woods. As we were walking on the shoulder of the road, I heard a vehicle coming from behind us. I turned around to try to wave it down and was shocked to see it was a white school bus approaching with all blacked out windows. As it approached, it slowed down and I thought that it was going to stop and let us on. But what happened was nothing but pure horror. It stopped right next to us and I approached the door, frantically, already pleading for help. But the door opened revealing a red light like you'd see in a photo lab and the driver was looking straight ahead and wearing all black robes with a hood pulled over his face. Then another roped figure emerged from the back and descended the steps and came face to face with me. I couldn't make out more than his chin with the heavy hood pulled over his head, but the voice sounded vaguely familiar and he said, Here, the master doesn't eat hands and he produced Eldon's right hand, still attached to the lower arm, almost up to the elbow, but otherwise severed from Eldon's body. 
He pulled it right out from behind his back and handed it to me. I reached out and grabbed it before I even realized what it was, and when I felt the cold, dead flesh, I gagged and dropped it. What? Holy shit, I screamed, and just punched the guy right in the mouth, which he took rather well. He just stepped back onto the bus in silence, and the door closed, and it drove off. I was stunned, just standing there on the side of the road, my wife in a comatose state and my friend obviously murdered. And we had no idea what happened to Lorraine yet. It seemed like forever before we got back to the Airbnb, but when we did, I sat Judy down on the couch while I got us some water and pondered what to do. I wasn't able to get a signal up there on my cell phone, but there was a landline in the shack, so I took a deep breath as I prepared to call 911 and explain everything to the police. But that never happened as the phone rang even as I was reaching for it. Hello? I answered questioningly. And the voice on the other end said, What did you think of our church? I hung up and called 911 immediately, but I got the impression the dispatcher was already expecting my call. The weird thing was, as I was talking to him, I realized that he must be part of the church. It was more than obvious. And then it hit me, where I had heard the voice of the man who handed me Eldon's arm, and I was floored and dropped the phone receiver immediately and was nearly as comatose as Judy for a moment. The man was the guy who owned the Airbnb. We have to get out of here, I said to Judy, panic setting back in. I was overwhelmed and the sense of alarm was flooding my system with adrenaline, which I thought I had all but spent over the course of the horrific night. But I grabbed Judy's hand again and we ran out of the room and fled down the road. We ran as long and as far as we could until we got to the main strip in the tiny town and found a black bear diner. We just sort of lurked behind the building until it opened the next morning, hiding from any vehicles that seemed to come by. Eventually I realized that was a very good decision as the white school bus with blacked out windows cruised by at one point, driving very slowly as if they were looking for us or somebody else. When the restaurant opened after the sun came up, we came out of hiding reeking of the dumpster area out back, but definitely alive. We sat at one of the booths and I didn't get the impression that the waitress, the cooks, or any of the few customers that came through had anything to do with the tragedies that befell our group. I still wasn't getting good enough service to make a call and not knowing who to trust, not knowing if the local police protected this group or not. It was such a small town the cops had to know about them, but eventually I struck up a conversation with a truck driver who was passing through from Portland to San Francisco. I offered him a couple hundred bucks to let me and Judy ride with him and gave him a very brief, very redacted version of what happened to us. It was at that point where he raised his left hand and I was sitting on the right side of him, so I hadn't noticed, but he had a prosthetic. The trucker said, Yeah, I grew up around here. Bad things happened to me too. Tell you what, you pay for breakfast and buy lunch on the way too and I'll get you as far down the road as you want to go, anywhere between here and San Francisco. I was floored. And I should have been even more reluctant, but I think at that point I was just exhausted and desperate. We rode with the man all the way to the Bay Area, and we talked with state police and eventually got a plane back home to L.A. We didn't find out what happened to Lorraine for two years when a group of Sasquatch hunters in the deep woods found her remains. Forensic examinations of her bones revealed that she had been bludgeoned, butchered, and chewed on by both human and non-human mouths. I haven't been to Northern California since.